Welcome to Unit 9, Video 2, Properties of Bonds. By the end of this video, you should understand bond energy and how it relates to bond strength and bond length. You should be able to determine if a bond is polar or nonpolar. And you should be able to draw a dipole arrow indicating which end of the bond has a partial positive charge and which end of the bond has a partial negative charge if the bond is polar. Bond energy is the energy required to break a bond. It's necessary to put energy in to break a bond. Imagine two people holding hands. If you wanted to break them apart, you'd have to apply energy to pull their hands apart. This tells us how strong the bond is. Bonds that require more energy to break are stronger than bonds that require less energy to break. This relates to bond length and bond strength. Bond length is the distance between the centers of two covalently bonded atoms. So you see at the bottom there's a chart telling us about bond length. At the top of the chart we see a CC bond, a single carbon-carbon bond. Bond order just means what kind of bond is it, single, double, or triple. And you notice the bond length, measured in picometers, is 154, and the bond energy is 347. Take a look at the table and try to see patterns in terms of how single bonds compare to double bonds compare to triple bonds. You might want to pause the video here and see if you can figure out this pattern on your own. What you may have found is that triple bonds tend to be shorter than double bonds which are shorter than single bonds. Likewise, triple bonds tend to have higher bond energies, therefore they're stronger than double bonds, which have higher bond energies and are stronger than single bonds. If a molecule exhibits resonance, remember that means that the bond is an average between the double and the single, or the double and the triple, or the single and the triple. The bond length and bond strength is an average of the two types of bonds. Now turning to bond polarity. Recall that covalent bonds involve a sharing of a pair of electrons. Previously we've been assuming that that sharing was equal, but it turns out that often the sharing of that pair of electrons is unequal. For instance, if I agree to share a car with my brother, if we each get it on the same number of days, then we're equally sharing that car. However, if I have the car five days a week and he only gets it two days a week, that's an unequal sharing. I'm kind of hogging the car. Turns out this is true of bonds as well, and it results in bond polarity. Bond polarity is a partial positive and partial negative charge on bonded atoms and it results from an unequal sharing of electrons in the bond. For instance, in the bond between hydrogen and fluorine, fluorine kind of hogs the electrons. The sharing is unequal. Therefore, fluorine will have more of the electrons bunched around it than hydrogen will. This means that fluorine will have a partially negative charge and hydrogen will have a partially positive charge, because if the electrons are bunched around fluorine, that will result in a negative end on the fluorine end and a positive end on the hydrogen end. Notice there are two ways to represent this. We can represent this with a dipole arrow. The arrow always points in the direction of the more negative end of the bond. You can kind of be reminded of this because there's that little positive plus sign looking symbol on the positive end of the dipole arrow. Or we can use these symbols to represent partial charge. Here, the partial negative end gets this symbol, and the partial positive end gets this symbol. Either way is fine. As electron sharing becomes more and more unequal, the bond polarity will increase, meaning as fluorine, for instance, hogs more and more of the electrons towards itself, it becomes more and more negative, and hydrogen in comparison becomes more and more positive. This will then increase the partial charges of each end. Why then does fluorine tend to attract the electrons in the bond towards itself more than hydrogen? This is due to electronegativity. Electronegativity, you might recall, is the ability of an atom in a molecule to attract shared electrons to itself. 
So that pair of electrons making up the bond, more electronegative atoms will be able to attract that pair to itself, more than less electronegative atoms. Electronegativity is a relative scale, so we can put values on it. In fact, a, a scientist called, named Linus Pauling put values on electronegativity. Here's his electronegativity chart um, below. Notice you'll see that the height of the block actually corresponds to the electronegativity value. And here's my dog Linus. You've seen him before. He's named after Linus Pauling. Uh, you'll see also that electronegativity generally increases across a period and increases up groups. Again, this is because our nucleus is getting more and more positive as we go across a group. Um, therefore, it's more able to attract electrons towards itself. You don't need to know the individual values of electronegativity, but you should know that it increases across a period and decreases down a group. It's also helpful to remember that francium has the lowest electronegativity and fluorine, F, has the highest. You'll notice that this periodic table does not include the noble gases. The noble gases do not have electronegativity values. It's useful to consider, based on the definition of electronegativity, why noble gases don't have electronegativity values. Perhaps we'll discuss this next class. Turning again to bond polarity, this means we can have two types of covalent bonds. We can have a nonpolar covalent bond, which shares electrons equally. This is usually made of two of the same atom, or two atoms with approximately the same electronegativity values. Since they each pull equally on the electrons, there's no partial charge on either end of the bond. Polar covalent bonds, on the other hand, share electrons unequally. This is, these are made of two atoms with different electronegativities. One is able to pull the electrons more closely to itself than the other. Here, the electron density is indicated by the blue blob. You'll see in a nonpolar covalent bond that the electron density, or the electrons themselves, are equally distributed between the two nuclei. The nuclei are represented by the black dots in the middle. On the right, we have a polar covalent bond. Here, the electron density is pulled towards the atom on the right. The atom on the right is more electronegative. Therefore, the atom on the right has a partial negative charge, where the atom on the left has a partial positive charge. Looking now at specific examples, take the H2 molecule. The H2 molecule only contains one bond, so when we talk about bond polarity here, it's the same as the polarity of that molecule, since there's only one bond in the molecule. The HH bond has two atoms with the exact same electronegativity, since they're the same atom. Therefore, the electrons are evenly dispersed throughout the bond, and neither side has a partial charge. At the bottom of your screen, you see HF on the other hand. As we've already discussed, fluorine has a very uh, high electronegativity value as compared to hydrogen. Therefore, it will have a much larger electron density, making it a partial negative charge around fluorine and a partial positive charge around hydrogen. Again, you can represent this with the symbols I've just drawn or with the dipole arrow as shown there. Recall that bond type falls on a continuum. We've discussed previously that whether or not a bond is ionic or covalent is not necessarily a cut and dry issue. A bond can lie somewhere in between ionic and covalent. The polarity of a bond, as we said, is determined by the difference in electronegativity. The bigger the difference, the more polar the bond. Generally speaking, if the difference between electronegativity values gets exceptionally high, there is no longer even a sharing of electrons. There's actually a transfer of electrons. And recall that a transfer of electrons is what happens when we have an ionic bond. Taking a look at this chart, we can see what we mean by the uh, bond type being on a continuum. Here we see that if the difference between the electronegativity values is zero, we have a nonpolar covalent bond. That means that it has a whole lot of covalent character. It acts a lot like a covalent bond and it hardly acts at all like an ionic bond. The electrons are equally shared. As the electronegativity difference gets bigger, however, the bond becomes more and more polar. 
it starts acting a little less like a covalent bond and maybe a little more like an ionic bond. Eventually, if the electronegativity difference gets very, very, very big, then the electrons are shared so unevenly that they actually become transferred from one atom to another. This again is an ionic bond. This, these bonds behave a lot like ionic bonds and not very much like covalent bonds. If we look again at the electronegativity scale, you'll see that the largest differences in electronegativities occur between the metals on this side of the periodic table and the nonmetals on this side of the periodic table. That explains why ionic bonds are generally made of a, a metal and a nonmetal. They represent the largest difference in electronegativity, although there are some exceptions to that rule. Likewise, covalent bonds are always made of two nonmetals. Notice that nonmetals have very similar electronegativity values. Therefore, they share electrons rather than transfer. Below you'll see a list of bonds. Take a moment to determine what type of bond each one is, either ionic, covalent, and if covalent, nonpolar covalent or polar covalent. You don't have to use the electronegativity values specifically, just generally is it a large difference or a small difference. If you determine that the bond is polar, draw a dipole arrow representing that polarity. Pause the video here and when you return I'll display the answers. Welcome back. Here's what you should have gotten. Notice that OF and NO both get dipole arrows pointing towards the more electronegative element. The BF bond and the FRF bond are both ionic, so I've labeled the positive ion and the negative ion. And the NN bond is nonpolar covalent, so it gets no dipole arrow. Let's take a look at a visual representation of this information. Here we have atoms A and B bonded together. Right now, both atoms A and B have very small electronegativity values, essentially equal electronegativity values. This is a very covalent bond. It's, a very, it's a, also a very nonpolar covalent bond. You'll notice there's no bond dipole shown. You'll also notice that the electron density is even throughout. There's an even shade of gray throughout. If we look at electrostatic potential, we'll see there is none. There's no positive end or negative end of this bond. However, if I start to increase the electronegativity of one of the two atoms, we'll see that a bond dipole begins to form. You'll also see that the bond becomes more and more ionic. Notice, as we get to the ionic end of our continuum, the electrons are now almost entirely around B, as indicated by the darker black area, and not at all around A, as indicated by the white area. We also have partial charges. B is negative, A is positive. If I turn on electrostatic potential, you'll see that the end marked B is much more negative than the end marked A. Again, if we decrease the electronegativity of B, the difference between our uh, positive and negative end decreases. The size of our dipole decreases and our bond becomes less and less polar. That brings us to the end of this video. Let's review our goals. First, we looked at bond energy and how it relates to bond strength and bond length, and we saw that triple bonds are shorter and stronger than single bonds and double bonds. Then we looked at bond polarity and determined if a bond is polar or nonpolar based on electronegativity differences. And then we looked at how to draw dipole arrows, indicating which end of a bond is partially positive and which end of a bond is partially negative. 